The Y Curve with Phil Dobby and Roger Hearing. Broadband, a luxury or a necessity? Around a million Britons have switched off over the past year, citizens' advice is saying. And the reason so many have gone offline is the cost. There are social tariffs, of course, to get people back on for less. But is it down to poverty or is internet access moving to our phones? 4 and 5G is a cheaper and better alternative. Or is the online revolution reaching its peak? Is the number going off-grid growing. Are the digital poor and the elderly becoming second-class citizens? And what does that mean for a world that does everything online? That's this week on The Y Curve, brought to you by Wigmore Associates. The Y Curve. So it's interesting, isn't it, this the, this uh, this question about whether we are actually, uh, you know, fixed to mobile substitution yeah. is what they call it in the industry. Yeah, yeah. And uh, are we just happy with our mobile phones? The problem is, if we all just went on our mobile phones and didn't use our <laughs> fixed line broadband connection, we wouldn't have the capacity on the mobile the system networks. The crash. The system yeah. Would crash. I mean, already, our, you know, I've yeah. noticed 5G was going to be this wonderful thing. It was going to be super fast. Yeah. But, of course, the more it's there... The more people are on it, the slower it gets. There's no better than 4G But it's now. not just that. It seems to be, and there is some evidence for this, that some, some people are just saying, look, we, you know, I'm, I'm done with this. I don't want mm. to do all this. They're revolting against the the necessity to do things online, which which is essential. Do you think? Do you think yeah. there's many people saying well, that? Well, there are some people doing it, apparently. Uh, it's, a way of, it's a way of kind of you know anyone? moving away from... Well, no, <laughs> obviously, because I'm online, so I can't find them. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> They're probably having a fantastic life somewhere. Well, this is, this is uh, what, what might be the, happening. Yeah. Those are the people who've still got their own head of hair. Yeah. They're looking less stressed and yeah, yeah. Uh, having a good life from it. And yet, you know, we are. There is this push around the world to say, yes, if we all have faster broadband mm-hmm. and more of it, then our economy is well, going to be so much better. And is that the case, I wonder? Yeah. Because cause we, if, if it is the case, then we're not doing particularly well because our fibre oil out here is a lot slower than many other parts of the world. So we're sort of like left at this 60 or 70 megabit per second speed mm-hmm. on our fixed broadband rather than getting up to gigabyte speeds. Yeah, and we're all dependent on a certain number of companies that provide it and the question mark is how safe are they i mean you know in, in an age when when a lot of systems can be taken down mm. relatively easily as we've seen certainly data can be nicked yeah uh there's a question mark as to, you know how safe is it to put all everything we have our lives effectively yeah online yeah absolutely yeah when the broadband goes i mean it happened on our street the other day everyone mm. was out on the street yes uh, looking at each other going my god what do, what do we do now we actually <laughs> couple of us went out for got a coffee because we thought well what else do we do yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was good for socializing i guess but i there mean we are. so we, the off-griders might be right yeah maybe they are yeah i don't know mm. but look uh, so an interesting discussion about all of that today and, and also the question about whether open competition is a good thing as well because mm. it's not just you know are we leaving ourselves open to network attacks but also just the reliability of it so bt's open reach tends mm. to do a lot of it yeah uh, but there's also a lot of new players coming into the marketplace as well and is that a good thing or a bad thing to have and, infrastructure competition and if we put certain people on low tariffs and all that Mm. are they getting a second class service Uh, and do we then just simply expand the digital divide there's so much to talk about we've got a great guest on all of this I've spoken to him before and he really knows his stuff because he used to be the uh, chief technology officer at uh, at BT when they were starting their sort of broadband rollout Uh, and he doesn't work for them now so he can say what he thinks so that's always good now look quickly before we do that how are you managing your money not just not not well not well not well well Well, not just your money of course also all your assets your home your investment portfolio your pension Are you getting the best return on all of this or are you optimizing the arrangements regarding tax for right now? But also, you know, what happens to your estate when you're gone? Have you got it all planned out correctly or does it all need a good looking at? And if the answer to that is it all needs a good looking at, well, we know the people to do that for you. Wigmore Associates, they can help with all of that. They're a boutique wealth management firm. They've been helping out people for decades. You can give them a call on 0207 224 That's 0207 224 3400 or visit wigmore-associates.co.uk. They are proud supporters of the YCAV. Uh, they allow us to be here. They and do indeed, everything. and we are truly grateful to them. Now, Peter Cochran, uh, Professor Peter Cochran. Sorry about that, Peter. Uh, he's a consultant engineer, technologist, futurist, entrepreneur, and advisor. And, and he a, joins us now. And former uh, CTO at BT as well. Uh, welcome, Peter. So, Peter, thanks for being with us. Um uh, the, the point of all this really is the sense that where are we with broadband, with internet access generally? I mean, well, first of all, what do you reckon to that idea that the people, perhaps up to a million people, are actually disconnecting from their broadband, according to Citizens Advice, and what it means? Well, I can quite understand them doing it in, the, in these times of uh, stress to uh, 
economics. And, uh, you know, what has actually happened is quite profound, I think. Uh, over 60% of users now use a small screen as their main screen in life. So an awful mm. lot of young people have a mobile phone, period. Um, they may have a tablet. Um, a lot of them do not go for the personal computer. And so we've got this very interesting mix. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we've got quite a lot of old people who've got an ancient P PC, and uh, they don't. Uh, there's a very few of them that don't have mobile phones, but they tend to have um, not really uh, multimedia capability. They're not really mobile computers. Uh, they are actually mobile phones. And so I can imagine yeah. that if you're struggling a little bit, you will ask the question, why am I buying broadband when I've got access with a good 4G or better still if I've got 5G? And I'm, I'm paying a lot of money for that and I've got a data account. And, you know, the average um, data usage, usage on mobile phones seems to be about nine gigabytes uh, a month. It's of that order. And you think, hmm, I can see why people are doing this. Um, I have a lot of uh, young people, friends, uh, who seem to be totally uh, glued to their mobile device. Um, and uh, the, it's not just social networks. They watch movies on it. Uh, and I, I find that quite intolerable. Uh, well, it's, it's the way of the world, isn't it? I mean, everybody, yeah. it seems like, has their, their, their nose stuck into a, into a mobile phone these days. But nine, nine gigabits seems uh, quite light on, really. I mean, it's, certainly my kids are using a lot more because I share data with them and I'm giving them 20 or 30 gigabits and then they come back asking for more later in the month. So, I mean, they're, they're on, a, uh, on, on a different level. And also, you know, it's so cheap now to buy unlimited plans as well for your mobile phone. So isn't there a danger that if this trend continues and we get people saying, oh, I'm okay on a small screen, why do I need yep. fixed broadband? I'm going to use 100 gigabits rather than nine. We're, we're yep. just going to run out of capacity, aren't we? Um, I, I think that's been the case, and it, it will always be the case. We will never have enough capacity. Uh, what, what people have missed in all of this is once you've got a bit of fibre in, and you do need optical fibre to all the cell sites for the mobile carriers. Um, doesn't really matter how many bits and bytes you put down there. It's roughly the same cost, not the same price, but it's the same cost. And it's very easy to upgrade a fibre to the terminal uh, network. Where you've got fibre all the way from the internet node right up to your premises or, or, or your tower then you can just keep increasing the amount of bits or uh, the bandwidth ad infinitum. Yeah, because my question about capacity wasn't, I mean, yeah, I mean, if it's if it's a connection to your home, that's fine. That can keep on going as the technology improves. But if you're, if you're talking about people using not Wi-Fi, but they're using the cellular network on their mobile phone because they've ditched the fixed line broadband, then it's the capacity from the, from the tower to your phone. And that's where we can run out of bandwidth, surely. Uh, well, you've put your finger on a number of key, uh, key points. So I'm going to paint a picture for you of what's really going to happen. Um, we are moving from a world of rather big terminals in relatively small numbers to uh, massive numbers of very small things. So uh, I've just done an experiment with some uh, Apple iTags and put them in the mail and sent them to various places, and it's quite fun to watch them going across the country. And um, this is a, a portent of a network to come. I just looked up the figures according to Ofcom. Uh, there are about um, 12 million things on the network. And I, I look at the world estimates for uh, the Internet of Things, and people have got numbers like 30 or 50 or 70 billion things online sometime in the future. And I think they're wrong by about an order of magnitude, no, two or three orders of magnitude, because I think it's going to be trillions of things uh, online. Now, because the mobile networks have been built without an eye on energy cost, and because the fiber networks or the copper network and then fiber has gone in with fiber to the curb, 
with these kilowatt cabinets uh, in the street, um, we now find uh, that the, the cost of all this energy for networking is quite vast. And uh, in China, for example, some of the 5G towers are running at over 12 kilowatts. And so at night, they switch them off to save energy. Now, if you, if you think of uh, a country that requires half a million towers at uh, 12 kilowatts, oh my, you better start building some power stations. And so there is, a, I'm going to suggest to you, but there is a thought, an alternative to using towers. And uh, when we get to the IoT, we're not going to be the, using the IoT. Parking. Just what is that? the Internet of Things? So, and the tags you were talking about, just for people yeah. who aren't quite uh, quite up on those as well. Yeah, these are things that you attach to devices so you the, can the find out where, where they are. are exactly. Yeah. So, uh, there's an alternative uh, to all of this, and uh, instead of communicating, well, let me take you this way. My my car has now got uh, forward looking radar, and um, very shortly, you know, the next model will have rearward looking radar, and on there, you'll be able to put information. And so communication car to car is something that's going to occur not too distant future. And I always think of an automobile, if you like, as being the internet on wheels, hundreds of chips connected together, communicating, and it's just a, a mobile node. Right. If we're going to do the IoT, where we actually tag absolutely everything, every component, every piece of clothing, every piece of food, we quickly get up to over a trillion tags. Now, you can't afford to use anything like milliwatts to communicate. We have to use microwatts. Unfortunately, physics is on our side because if we're only communicating over one to 10 meters, we can get away with only a few microwatts. And that works. And that leads us to conclude that a mesh net where things talk to each other in close proximity. Properly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. A bit human like, if mm. you like. So that could work. So what, what, the, the issues here, just to sort of summarize, it's getting quite technical, it's good, but we need to just get a sense. What you're saying is rather than capacity, it's energy that, that could be the, the problem in all this. The fact that we just simply wouldn't have enough uh, at cost to be able to provide what we need for trillions of things. Correct. And, and that is because we've held on to models for wireless communication that go back to uh, nine, uh, sorry, yes, 1915, and because people have hesitated and not put fiber all the way uh, to the customer. And so you have um, some server farm, if you like, or a, a network provider base station in the center of the network and the fiber goes out there but on the way they have a cabinet and they convert to um copper for the last uh, few hundred meters or uh, they put in things where they split the optical fiber uh, so that you can get more people on it now let me tell you where that philosophy came from way back in the 80s the cost of fiber was several pounds a meter. And so these passive optical networks where the fiber is split a little bit like a water pipe going down the street, it, it was it was evolved to save money using less and less fiber. Now the fiber costs a pence a meter. You want to waste the fiber, put it in everywhere to everybody and not have any splitters and not have any complexity. And certainly you don't want any electronics in the field you just want electronics at the uh, supplier end and at the customer so, so we are very slow though aren't we in getting fiber out in this country so we're still i'm looking at some figures here saying from last year that 72 percent less than 72 percent of premises are dsl so that is that you know DSL. That, so dsl is, is what you're talking about fiber to the cabinet primarily so it's so it's it's where it's fiber up to that box at the end of your street then becomes uh copper to the home so 72 yep. percent in our country uh, compared to, for example, 48% in Australia, 12% in the United States. And the difference is that they've all got fiber. So we've got 8.6% of premises are fiber all the way compared to, for yep. example, 87% in Korea, 84% in Japan. Even Spain is up at 81%. The United States is 20% because they've got a lot of cable there rather than fiber. So I guess that's, that's, that's legacy stuff. 
but it's but generally we are a long way behind on this. And I know OpenReach is there saying, "Oh, we're you know we're rolling out millions over the next uh, the next few years." But it's still pretty slow, isn't it? Well, if I just give you a little bit of history, uh, way back in 1990, uh, my old company, British Telecom, had built a couple of factories, and we were making the systems to roll out uh, into the local loop. So uh, in, 1980, uh, in 1986, uh, I proved that fiber to the home was cheaper than any other alternative, including the installed copper. Uh, it was a no-brainer. So we set about creating the companies and the capability to manufacture and roll out fiber to uh, the, the home in the UK. Uh, we were working uh, very closely with at and We were working very closely with the Japanese. Um, uh, the Americans had the split up of AT&T, um, which stopped their program. The Japanese had no such impediment and went ahead and got fiber in everywhere now and have had it in for decades. Uh, the UK, unfortunately, suffered political interference that stopped the program. And it was all about um, you know, why or, you know, why are, are, is our telephone company going to manufacture systems? Why? And and we were we were sort of licensing the technology, things like blown fiber, uh, the fiber manufacturing, uh, the um, the low cost uh, optical terminals, the whole works. And so the the program stalled, and and it, it was it was dead by about 1992. And then the only option was to go for copper. So billions have been spent on the wrong technologies in the uk and by the way right across europe right across north america they've done exactly the same thing and so it, it's yeah. uh, to my mind it, it's a little bit sad uh, that people couldn't see um the benefit but people were saying things like we'll, we'll never need 10 megabits you know what are we going to do with 10 megabits um you're crazy but it's a fair enough question. I mean, that is what it, what is the, what is the business case for? Apart from if it's cheaper than running copper, then that's a business case in yeah, itself. I, I can see that 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 would be an argument. But, but for, as as to why we need those faster speeds, I mean well, that that has been. Well, yeah, and that, that goes to the wider question. I mean, we've done sort of quite a close technical look at, at, at the way it works. But is it clear that we are simply going to require more and more and more, or are we reaching a kind of limit? where we have enough. I mean, is there ever that point likely to happen with all the trillions of things you're talking about? So those countries that have got much faster speeds and more fibre, are they doing much better than us, for example? It, it has a profound effect on the economy, as do as does the lack of good roads. You know, pe the, the UK has got a famously poor level of uh, productivity. Um, a lot of that is down to infrastructure, time-wasted, uh, inability to... Uh, get the job done. Now, I, I gave a, a, a presentation earlier this week to a group, and uh, in my view, the single biggest change agent we have seen uh, in my lifetime was COVID, because these very discussions we're having, having uh, I've, for decades, I've been going to conferences where it's been, uh, what do we need video conferencing for? You know, it, it, it doesn't really work very well, et cetera, et cetera. And we're not going to do education online because of... And then all of a sudden, within two weeks, it all was done. And it was done by individuals. And people took, if you like, the law into their own hands and started talking to each other on conferencing. And um, all the private schools in the UK went straight on to video conferencing for their pupils. Uh, the unions in the UK prevented the public sector doing that for a long time. But we can change as a society very, very quickly. Um, I always say to business students, if you want to appear absolutely dumb, make the following statement. There is no proven business case for this technology. Well, there was no proven business case for a bicycle, a sewing machine, and a, a pen, a pencil, or anything else. New technology always rides on a little bit of risk. But remember, only going back 40 years, the world demand for computers is only three in the UK. <laughs> and why would you want one in your home? What would you do with it? 
So I wonder whether the speed, though, of adoption of a fixed broadband into the home is going to be slow, not just because I, I feel like open reach is, is, is being slow. And I'm only saying that because, uh, I, you know, they haven't I, reached you yet. They, well, they, yeah, they haven't reached me and they <laughs> won't. So we live in Farnham in Surrey. We, we are a commuter town to London where a whole load of people, uh, you know, who used to travel into London every day and are going in once a week and are working from home. And, uh, and open reach is saying, oh, yeah, by the way, we, we, we've got a three year plan that's going to cover 80 or 85% of mm-hmm. the country. And guess what? You're not on it. So, uh, so, so we're stuck with fifty megabits a second. Yeah. But, if it, but I mean, it, 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 so maybe it's you know, is it happening slowly, or are we going to find that those kids who are now just saying, well, look, you know, we're okay on our mobile networks. So are we going to see that the demand falls away more, and they're going to say, yeah, we, we we're happy with our five G plans. We'll stick with that, we'll and, s- and all the rest of it becomes redundant. I think one of the things that will happen is that very slowly they will find themselves unable to do their job. Uh, without more than that. Um, I struggle to find people now who don't work at least two days a week at home. So um, in the case of uh, my family, uh, I have uh, several uh, who have to be in at work every day, but mostly there is this go to work to be with people and actually physically do stuff and then be at home for deep concentration and high productivity. And um, without broadband, you can't do that. And so I think you have to leap forward just a little bit and think, what does AI, what does quantum computing mean? And what does that do to productivity? And then there are a few other things like let's stop shipping products and let's start shipping designs. And so if you imagine going down to buy some new tires for your car and getting them fitted, what happens when they are printed? Mm. So 3D the printing essentially is what you think will, will yeah, take well, it. Additive manufacturing in general mm. means that you will be able to make more and more and more things uh, locally, I mean, this is sort of the core of Industry 4.0 and Society 5.0, where we actually start to take a hold of more. And if you think in terms of uh, healthcare and medicine, no matter how much money, how many people the government throw at the NHS, it will never work as people want it to work. And people are having, going to have to take charge of a larger proportion of their health care. And fortunately, the electronics, the instrumentation to do that is now with us. I mean, I can do a perfectly good ECG on my wristwatch. Uh, that was something I dreamed of even when we first met. I think it's not all that long ago. That was totally impossible. And so being able to monitor um, and uh, get the data about your own body is becoming mm. easier and easier. And we're doing it at home to a standard that's on a par with a hospital, not just the doctor's but surgery. Isn't the problem then in all this, all everything we've talked about, a matter of security and reliability? The more we rely on these things, we know that systems are hackable, we know that systems are faulty on occasion and can fall down. The more pressure we put on the system, the more likely it is perhaps to fail, but but is, are we expanding at a rate where we can't really guarantee the results even to an acceptable standard and putting everything at risk on that basis? Um, I find that hard to believe. Let's just take an extreme view. Let's switch the Internet off now and see how long this society goes, because within a week you'd have no food. You'd have no electricity, you would have no heat, light, power, water, or waste disposal. Uh, trading would stop. The whole world, so the world would already, it would come to a halt. So the standard of living and the number of people that are living on this planet is allied directly to our technology. If you go back to when I was a child, where slightly less than 3 billion people uh, were on the planet, they could not support more than that with that Victorian model of the supply chain and the healthcare and everything else. So this is a conundrum. 
It really is a conundrum. Our reliance on technology is like a ratchet. It goes one way. There is no going back. If you were to say, okay, let's switch off a piece of technology, what would it be? Suppose you switched off just uh, a, an MRI scanner, for example. How would you feel about the millions of people that are now going to die as a result? You know, this is, it's, it's, we're locked into a cycle of dependence on technology that is irresistible. Uh, but also it's, very, it's, very it's, risky. I mean, for exactly the reasons you're saying. And, it, and it's, it's also, of course, in the hands of private enterprise. So they determine the speed. So if you and look the security uh, and the security levels. But I mean, if you, if you look at, for example, 5G was going to be wonderful, but I already have noticed it's slowing down, presumably because there's not been the level of investment as more people move on to it. So we've got actually uh, looking at UCLA who measure. Uh, I mean, these aren't totally accurate because they basically based on speed tests that people take and normally you only take a speed test on your on your device when mm. it, the network is either running very slow and you want to see how, just how slow or it's very large and you mm. want to show off to people how fast your internet connection is but ookla has got in the uk but it's the same thing around the world they've got 43 megabits per second is the uh, average speed on mobile networks in the uk compared to 80 in the us 86 in australia 146 in norway 182 in the uae so our mobile networks are I mean, 43 seems fast compared to where we were, but slow compared to anywhere else. And that will be to do with the level of investment and the speed of that investment by a very small number of, of, of operators. Correct. Correct. But here's, here's uh, what has actually happened. Uh, if I go back to the start of my career, projects of that nature were engineered and they were run by engineers. You didn't get all the BS that goes along with the projects that are now run by management. So all the promises, all the BS marketing to build up the sales demand comes entirely from a line of management and management thinking, and it's about money. And uh, so shortcuts have been taken, and there's been a total lack of investment in fiber infrastructure for the mobile networks, period. And, and that's principally why it's slow. But you, you only have to look at, say, uh, Skynet, you know, uh, shall we say, uh, sorry, Starnet. Uh, Sky, Sky, Skynet's and Terminator, I think, which is yes, perhaps another. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we don't want to go there just yet. Yeah. That's always on my mind. <laughs> I can imagine, yes. <laughs> so, but it would be so, nice, actually, if that didn't happen because the broadband connection was a bit dicey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's, uh, we're, in a, we're in a period of... Uh, a lot of advertising and uh, uh, poor delivery. And, mm. um, and most of these things can be worked out on a very small piece of paper with a pen that they're not going to deliver. Because uh, if you, you, you get a headline number, you're going to get 300 megabits per second on this uh, satellite system. Well, that's great. But it's no good putting 300 megabit capacity on that satellite system because once you get more than one customer, it's going to go down. Mm, yeah. uh, it's just not rocket science. It's simple uh, arithmetic. It, is there a like case? It? Is there a case, Peter? For I mean, you, you, you've made a very good point about how reliant we are on it. For saying it's reached a point where having internet access is almost like a kind of human right. It's almost the, the essential of life, like water, yes. or that kind of a thing, and therefore should be regulated. More. Regulated, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. I was going to say state uh, control, but of course, water isn't. Um, we've done a podcast on that yep. fairly recently. But but the, they should be much more regulated to make sure that it's accessible to all and at a certain. Standard. And there are countries where there are there are limitations on speed. If you you have to if you're providing a service, there's a minimum speed that you have to adhere yeah. to i mean that that sort of thing would ensure if, that if you go the, to korea you get mm. you get a gigabit mm. yeah yeah it's okay. easy to do isn't it and it, and it, and the argument for that would be for all the arguments you've been giving about productivity if you can yes. do so much more with better speeds then it doesn't matter who provides it so long as it's reliable and that is another uh, you know that's and available a, to all and available to yeah well let me then, let me just point out to you that there is a very important factor in human pro productivity and creativity that, that you need bandwidth for, but you're not actually using the bandwidth. And what this is about is delay. If you haven't got bandwidth, you get delay. 
And if you put delay into human communication and computer communication, guess what? Creativity and productivity fall because communication goes down and it's allied to that. I sometimes demonstrate in this class for students by punctuating each word with a three second delay. It kills your concentration. If you're, if you're on, a, on a run of thinking and creativity, the important thing is not to break that strand of thought and delay does that for you. Right. But I mean, that's going to be pretty bad to get, I mean, you, to get a three well, second I remember buff, so, buffering and dial up. Yeah, so that, that was definitely that. the old. I mean, we're on, like at this end, I think about 50 megabits per second. I don't know why you're at your end. And we seem to be communicating all right. We are. We're only using voice. You left a delay there just to prove, <laughs> just to prove your point, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> let, let, me, let me give you a, 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 a vision. Uh, I, I actually uh, met my wife. Uh, but my first wife, unfortunately, died. I met my second wife, and uh, I was traveling all over the world, and a good deal of our, to use a, uh, an old-fashioned phrase, a good deal of our courting was done online. We had a daily meetup, and what you want to do there is get a very important human uh, factor across. It is very simply that the emotional bits are the most important bits. And it's something to the, this day, the telecoms industry is still not figured out. They're still about trying to crush the signal down to smaller and smaller and get more down the pipe. Where in actual fact, if you look at the entertainment industry and the games industry and the people who are providing services like this, they give us good voice quality and they give us good video quality. You know, you need to look somebody in the eye. You need to see their... Um, their facial expression, you need to see their body language to be able to communicate effectively. So uh, th th are we being held back then by the fact that we do have too few players and should we have more competition? If we had regulations hey, saying, hey, you've got to meet these minimum speed requirements, because OpenReach is saying they're going to reach 25 million premises, uh, which is about 80% of the population, I think, in the next uh, next couple of years. So 2025, I think, and then so that, that, that's just reach 85%. Not quite sure what they're doing about the other 15%, which is a bit of a problem because I'm in a, in a town that's in that 15% yeah. for whatever reason. Uh, but they say that that's 25 million premises they will meet if the right investment conditions are in place. Yeah. So, I mean, that just means that's if we if we have to, if we can make money out of sweating the, sweating the assets we've got now yeah. uh, because there's not enough competition, then we'll, we'll be slower than that. That's pretty much what that's saying, isn't it? Um, I, I think... It's a get-out yeah, anyway. Yeah, I think this is uh, really sort of... A distortion of, of what ought to be happening. You know, there are an awful lot of small companies that are putting fiber in. Yeah. Uh, they're putting uh, uh, all, all kinds of facilities in. Is that a good thing, to have more more com more competitors providing uh, more infrastructure? I, I always think that competition uh, makes quite a big difference. Uh, mm. A long time ago now, I concluded that the best option for the UK would be to open up all the ductwork for anybody to use it. Uh, BT's got, you know, the single biggest asset BT has got is a hole in the ground, i.e. these ducts full of cables. Get yeah. all that copper out, open them up. The fibre takes less space. And you could, uh, you have to think uh, like this, uh, and I've done this with politicians uh, we're in the business, if we're not careful, of building uh, two M6 motorways or three or four or five, six M6 motorways side by side when we only need one good one. Once we got fibre in, then we should be making the fibre accessible. If we're going to have open uh, wireless networks, and if Ofcom have got the power to say, you can have this bit of bandwidth and you can have that bit of bandwidth. Why well, hadn't Ofcom got the power to say, we will take the bandwidth on the fiver and we'll carve it up so that we can get uh, multiple suppliers onto uh, one 
fiber instead of right. putting lots and lots of fiber in. Power. So you get special, so you get specialist providers for some of the internet. Yeah, in competition then rather than regulation is what I'm yeah, taking from what you're saying. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same with towers. When we were when we were doing, we started doing the mobile network. I was running around all the mobile operators and said, "Can we just stop and have a conference on this? This is not some phallic." contest where you're all going to put towers up as many as you can because it's going to cost each of you about two billion there's five of you that's 10 billion spend right off the bat for for the first mobile networks why don't we just put two billion pounds worth of towers up and share the towers this is not a competition about towers it's a competition about service no but we like looking at towers we want to see lots of towers on the on, <laughs> on the hillside so just on the on the idea about the ducts so the big problem for competition there is so if an infrastructure provider comes along and says right we're going to fiber up this town uh, because uh, open reach is saying that well, they're not going to do it for another three years if, if ever uh, so we're going to do it for them uh, we're going to we're going to provide a service and we're going to make it available to to yeah. retailers we're, we're going to hold sale the uh, but the ducts of course are f- filled with the uh, with the with the open reach copper at the moment and there might not be room for my fiber so open reach can come along and say well when we do it we just pull out the copper and put our fiber in but somebody else can't do that because open reach will be saying no that's our copper leave it alone so should the regulation be changed to say yeah. well actually if someone if someone gets there first they should be able to pull out that copper if they're going to provide uh, if they're going to provide a, a fiber access to everybody. You, see, you know, just whoever gets there first is, is able to do it. I think we have to start thinking about the good of the nation and not the good of a company. What's the benefit to uh, the nation, uh, and what's the benefit to the GDP of the nation versus what's the benefit to the bottom line of any one? So is that company? a yes then? If, so if someone else comes along? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, it's a yes. I, I think I've, I've argued this case for a long time. And uh, in the case of uh, Openreach and, and BT, there is a handsome business to be negotiative of doing several things. One, negotiating the cost of that space, the maintenance of that space, the provision of the cables, and then they have a lot of buildings that make perfect data centers that are partially full because the equipment's got smaller, where they could be providing a, a hosting facility that is physical. Uh, and so th- there, there's a, a new business model out there in the making that says we are actually uh, not only a telecoms or an internet provider and a, mo- a mobile provider or whatever, we're also an infrastructure provider and we can provide people with um, mm. uh, 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 outsourcing the, the yeah. if you like, the, the actual physical uh, bits of the network, yeah. like the building. And with an eye to the, the public good, which is, which is really what we're it talking about. With an eye so it sounds like we do need yes. a regulation overhaul, yeah. doesn't it? Really, that's the that's the upside of all we, of this. As we sort of come to the end of this, Peter, and just get a sense, I mean, you've you've said a lot about what you think should happen. What do you think are the chances that we will that there there will be the political will to do the kind of things you're talking about? I think one of the biggest limitations is that 17th century institution called Parliament, uh, which was okay in its day, but it's not all that well suited to managing a 21st century economy. Um, and so it's it's a, a I, I don't want to suggest for one moment that we destroy our democracy. I'm a great believer in democracy, but the methods and and the way in which we manage our society are somewhat in the wrong century. And when you have people who are not using this technology or do not understand this technology arguing uh, the case then it, it, it just becomes slowed. It becomes uh, uh, absolutely yeah. mired. So we desperately need right now, for example, uh, several nuclear power stations. But it's hard to see 
how the government will actually make a decision because it will make them a bit unpopular with the voter. So there we are. You've, you've opened a hole. They will be very unpopular. Yeah, they'll be very unpopular with the voter when the television goes off. And <laughs> now, Peter, we have to go now because you've sort of like uh, you started a whole new discussion about whether Parliament's fit yes. for purpose. And there's another <laughs> half an hour we're going to talk to you about that. So we better go before before we can't. Uh, so great to talk to you again, Peter. And we'll definitely have you back on uh, on the Y Curve. Good to have you on today. Well, thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. So it's interesting that he talked about yeah. the need to revamp Parliament because that's actually pretty much <laughs> what we're going to talk about next well, in week. In one very specific area. Now, you may have heard of a certain honours list hmm. um, that came out fairly recently by uh, a man who had been Prime Minister, in fact, who had been an MP. But what was no his name again? So easily J. forgotten. He began with J, I think. Hmm. Anyway, his dad almost got uh, an honour. And indeed, the whole thing <laughs> seemed to be a little bit strange. A 28-year-old girl, who, a lady, woman, who may uh, well have deserved it, became hmm. the youngest peer. Yeah. Um, but, but it did sort of shine a light into something that's a bit strange, that we should have one part of our parliamentary system that comes from people being nominated potentially for, I don't know, giving money to to the, a certain party or uh, or other services, but but not exactly democratic. Um, and also, you know, why this handing out of it was knighthoods joke, and this I kind mean, of stuff? I mean, let's be honest, the whole thing was a joke, wasn't it? And well, it, make, it, was make, it does make way. a joke of of our parliamentary system. Mm. And then so there's the fundamental question of is if it can be abused in that way. I mean, yeah. just as Peter does it saying, need a major it, overhaul? Yeah, just generally both houses, well, but particularly the House yeah. of Lords. You know, it raises that whole question again. Yeah. Do we need the House of Lords? Do we need the honour system as it is? Mm. Um, Either because you know if you're if you're rewarding essentially loyalty to certain politicians that, that does feel a little bit grubby. But then if you get rid of the House of Lords and you have a Senate, an elected Senate, well, then that's that, a whole other can of worms. Yeah, but it seems to work in many other parts of the world. The Australian system, which is seems to work. <laughs> well, so the Australian system is that you you have Australia doesn't work. It, <laughs> doesn't it? No. Well, it seemed to work when I was there. No, but no, it, no, no. But the uh, I, 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 because the Senate there is proportional representation basically. Mm, mm. So you've got the best of both. Well, and you've got then. some pretty strange coves in it. You do you. have some strange coves. That's case, very true. Case, case yeah, proven. okay. Maybe, maybe you're right. Anyway, we will debate this all at some length <laughs> on the next uh, <laughs> edition on the next of the edition. Edition. Wine Yeah, brought, brought to, you to you by Wigmore Associates. We really should work out who's going to say what at the end, shouldn't we? Uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. The Wine Curve.